This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technology, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we have on our show Humayun Sheikh and Toby Simpson, who are CEO and CTO of Fetch.ai respectively. Fetch.ai is an ambitious project that seeks to merge machine learning and blockchain technology in order to build a collective super intelligence. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Nice, great to be here. So let's let's start with Humayun. Like, tell us a bit about your background and how you got to be involved at this project at the intersection of machine learning and blockchains. Sure. Uh, my background is in computing, but um, I've spent the last 10 years of my life in commodity uh, trading, uh, building algorithms for the commodities market. And uh, seven years ago, I, um, I, I was one of the investors in DeepMind, one of the early investors in DeepMind, um, because we were working on the gaming side with uh, Demis as well. And so we met, the team met, myself and Toby met roughly 15 years ago, and we've been on and off working into the intersection of commodity trading and um, price prediction models and uh, al- generating algorithms to um, predict the commodity pricing. So that's been my background for the last uh, six or seven years. In terms of how we got to um, the fetch, what was quite interesting was that when you look at predicting uh, commodity prices, um, uh, a very basic way to look at it would be what's happening in different uh, markets. But what is more interesting is if you start bringing context and uh, various different information bases into the price prediction model, and you can start building correlations, uh, then you realize very quickly that uh, the, the the price prediction is effectively, you know, five or six times better very easily when you start building these correlations. So what was quite interesting then is that if you extrapolate this whole uh, thinking on commodity pricing and actual physical commodities, and then you start bringing in uh, ways to form correlations in a distributed um, kind of environment, um, the results improve considerably. So we did um, some trials over the last couple of years uh, on and off with our third co-founder, which is Thomas Hain, who is a professor in Sheffield University, uh, machine learning and AI. We, we did some trials and we realized that um, to improve prediction models, we need to have a system which brings distributed information uh, to improve the correlations. So that's really how I... Um, got involved in starting a fetch and and just a brief interjection so regarding deepmind many have probably heard of deepmind which was uh, you know started a few years ago and became a very big machine learning company and then got bought up by google for lots and lots of money uh but my kind of exposure to deepmind so Meher recommended this documentary to me called alpha go zero about something that they did you know uh, DeepMind did to build a program that's very good at, at Go and got better than the best Go player. And so there's a documentary about that, which is absolutely fascinating. So I, I highly recommend that. So you you were one of the early investors in DeepMind, right? So as far as I'm aware, like the company started out pretty small and then was bought out for Google for 400 million. Could you give get into the story of DeepMind and what they set out to do in the beginning and what they ended up doing and how they discovered that path? Well, I j- just want to make it clear that um, my uh, investment and interest came in because I've known Demis for roughly 15 years now. Um, we we worked together. He was one of our advisors in a uh, kind of a small a game which was bringing the real life products into the virtual products and that's exactly how um, I met Demis which is 15 years ago. Um, what was quite interesting was that Demis had a great 
uh, well, he's a great mind of our times, and I think he he has um, he has done a great job in building the company. What what his concept was that neuroscience, which is the the PhD degree he achieved, um, he was looking to bring the general intelligence to life effectively. And um, we we were having um, yeah lunch over in in Cambridge and Browns, and uh, when he proposed it, and he said, "Well, do you want to put some money in?" And I thought, "Well." There are three passions in which I have. Um, one, one of them is machine learning and AI, and there is no. And the other one is the virtual worlds and the decentralization. Um, so you know, I couldn't have missed that opportunity. So I invested in that. And what the the concept was to bring the artificial general intelligence um, and the best way to show the benefits of it was in the gaming area, which is where. Again, uh, Demis and his background uh, led him to. So that's how it all started. But the ambition was to build something great, which is what they did. And to be fair, I mean, we, we, uh, you know, DeepMind is not just uh, in the UK, but probably worldwide, one of the best um, AI companies which have come about. And, and the journey has been obviously very ambitious, and Demis um, set the goal very high, um, which, you know, although having said that, you know, we, artificial general intelligence is not an easy one to crack, uh, but they're making some great inroad into it. I mean, it's it's quite a, you know, and I'm not, I wouldn't say that they've cracked it, but I'm saying that in doing so, they've achieved quite wonderful, great things, which Go is an example of that. Now, moving on to to Toby, um, you've also worked at DeepMind, but your your background has been you've you've founded quite a few different companies over over the years. So, like, walk us through walk us through your history. Well, I started uh, programming computer games in the early '90s, back in back in the Amiga days, uh, and then uh, had the, the the great privilege of been involved in a product called Creatures. Um, I was the the director and producer of the Creatures series. And what really interest me, interested me about Creatures was that uh, the guy who invented the technology for that believed that if you modelled all of the biological building blocks of life and you, you put them all together, you might actually get digital life. And that's precisely what he did. And we had a genetically specified uh, little creature that was made up of chemical reactions, emitters, receptors and, and, and neural dynamics um, that would learn by itself how to survive and, and, and live in the environment that it was in. And what was really exciting about that was that all of those components were specified in a genetic code. So you could get a, a, a mummy creature and a daddy creature, and then you would have a baby creature that was made of a combination of the genetics from, from both parents. And if that creature was better suited to surviving in its environment and more likely to make it to breeding age, then it would be the one that was most likely to provide its genetic code to the next subsequent generations. So effectively, what the computer was doing was automatically fine-tuning itself to better work in the environment that it was in. Now, I found this really exciting because it meant that the computer was finally the bit that was doing all of the hard work. And so long as we created a rich, dynamic environment uh, and had a big enough population of little bits um, in, in that world, uh, we would have these these virtual animals uh, effectively learning how to, to to live in that environment without the need for human intervention. And I was kind of curious as to whether or not that um, thoroughly bottom-up development philosophy, effectively, and design philosophy could be applied to something grander, and in particular, the creation of very large-scale um, virtual worlds, which has been a passion of mine now for well, more than a quarter of a century. The so, idea that we could, yes? Toby, may, may I ask a question on this uh, creatures thing? Because that sounds really fascinating. So I'm just curious if, you know, you said these creatures would be able to learn on their own and they have this DNA and adjust. So where does the player come in here? Like, would you make decisions that then the creature executes? Or like well, you can ask the creature to do something, but of course there was no guarantee that it would choose to listen to you. It kind of depended on what it had learned to associate with you. Uh, and you could interact with these creatures, so you could give them a little tickle and you could give them a little, a little slap if you thought that they were misbehaving. So of course, in fact, if you did that quite a lot, then eventually they'd be quite frightened of, of, of your hand in the world and they would learn to associate bad things with, with your presence. 
And that was that was kind of fun to watch happen. I guess to a certain extent, when human beings get involved in this, it becomes more unnatural selection than natural selection. Um, but uh, it, it was still quite quite quite. A, in fact, uh, one one thing that's probably worth mentioning is people got so attached to these creatures that uh, in the end we had to develop uh, effectively a funeral kit add-on to allow them to to write a few words to remember the creatures by when when they passed away. And this came about because even back then, in in in, in the mid '90s, people were setting up websites and writing poetry and stories about the creatures that they'd had and 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 the existence that they led, and, and drawing whole family trees of how they went. And of course, you know, looking back now, you sort of think, well, goodness, if we were to do something like that today, we'd get to collect the complete family tree of all of these things. But uh, back then, that wasn't that wasn't technically practical. Those that were on the internet tended to be modems. But but yeah, so uh, creatures effectively was a general purpose problem solver. Um, we didn't have any rules in that system. We didn't specify to the creature how to eat. We just gave it an instinct to pick things up and stick it in its mouth. Um, and if the first ten things that it ate turned out to be rocks, then eventually it would learn that sticking things in its mouth was a bad idea, and that's not necessarily a good thing for the creature. Um, and and the idea that that we could we could apply that bottom up philosophy to creating virtual worlds was 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 extremely fascinating. Uh, and those worlds, uh, well, we one of the things that was always my favourite was my world in a box, um, where you started with one agent, then you had two, four, eight, sixteen, and before you knew it, you had a world that consisted of trees, animals, plants. But the wonderful thing is, all of those things were real; they weren't painted on, a bit like the Simpsons episode where the fire exit was painted on the wall. And they asked whether they could have a real one in future. These things were all real. So if you reversed a truck into a tree and knocked it over, you could potentially build a bridge out of it or a log cabin out of it. And we didn't need to know about bridges or log cabins or program any rules in advance for that to be possible. And this is great in virtual worlds because you can't predict what one person is going to do in a world, let alone tens of thousands. And the idea that you can do anything that you perceive as been practical is really interesting particularly when the complexity, the really fun stuff, the grey areas that the, that's the difference between believable and not believable, is entirely an emergent property. And this is effectively the field of artificial life, where you have a very large population of simple things that combine to produce more complicated behaviour. Uh, and uh, Hermione and I had often um, talked about the idea that potentially it might be possible one day to build one of these worlds that was grand enough and big enough and could have a large enough population of objects that we could actually do useful uh, economic work in it. Um, and we'd sort of toyed with all these various ideas as to how that might work. But uh, the, the, the technologies that I've been using tended to involve a great number of servers um, acting as a client server type technology. And then, of course, we bump into decentralized ledger technologies and it's just like click, well, this is it, isn't it? Now, suddenly, we can construct a world of extraordinary proportions, and we can fill it with an amazing population, a population of things that represent humans, that represent hardware, that represent data or sensors or services, and they can all interact on this network, decentralized across the entire globe. Uh, and we aren't restricted in the way that you are with the real world, where if we're all looking at the same table, we're all seeing the same table. In a digital world, there's no such restriction. Um, each individual could have that world tailored specifically for them. And that gets really exciting because, of course, you can ensure that the things that you want or the things that you might want are the things that you see. Okay. So when you were talking about creatures, uh, it it felt a bit like CryptoKitties. Have you, have you followed that project? Which one, sorry? CryptoKitties. Oh, CryptoKitties. I'll tell you what, I'll bet the creators of Ethereum never saw that one coming. Um, yeah. I, I think it's a wonderful thing, and, and, and it's a great idea, uh, and, and it introduced a whole generation of people who suddenly wanted something that was unique to them, um, to, to this whole um, crypto space. But yeah, that, that was a very cool thing, um, and, uh, and, and the idea that potentially all of these little entities that, that work together um, could be more than just visual representations, but could have personalities and existences and memories and behaviours and could live on a digital space that was optimized just for them is another layer of, of excitement on top of that, I think. But it's a great space. I mean, don't you find it's just like 
but for me, I sort of see it as a bit like um, the internet in, in the mid 90s. Everybody knew that it was going to fundamentally change the way that, that we live our lives. Um, we're all experimenting with all these different ideas, but but nobody was quite sure how. I mean, we didn't see social network coming, um, social networking coming back in back in the mid '90s. But but look where we are today. And I look at the decentralized ledger technology, the blockchain space, the crypto space, and it does feel that level of excitement that that we all believe that the space that we're in is is extraordinary, and it's going to change the way that that we live our lives. And we're all trying out these amazing new ideas and exploring this space to see to see how that might work. One thing that came to mind to me when you when you talk about these virtual worlds is something like Second Life, right? Where you also had this this whole world where at some point you know people would sell digital real estate or build businesses to create these virtual things and sell them, and you know for a short time it seemed like it could be, become a big thing, and then of course it sort of disappeared. Is that also something that inspires you or that you think about when it comes to the design of, of what you guys are working on now? Well, that, that kind of thing, and we, we were building our um, artificial life-inspired virtual worlds at the same time that, that Second Life was out there. And, and I always take this approach of, of, of digital Lego, that if you provide the low-level building blocks, then the physics takes care of your syntax errors. So if you give people a pile of bricks um, and they build an upside-down pyramid, sooner or later physics is going to knock it over. If you provide people with a whole load of aeroplane parts, and um, they stick 100 engines on both wings, then the physics of the environment is going to ensure that that thing isn't going to leave the ground. And even if it could, the fuel consumption would be outrageous. Um, so that, that ability to ensure that you don't have to worry about consistency errors in, in a world is extremely important. Uh, and you do need that scalability. It's not, a, it's not a, for me anyway, I always thought, well, it's not a true virtual space if I existed in a shard with 20 people. I want to exist in a space with everybody. I want to be able to look out on these worlds and be able to imagine that in front of me, there are millions of people in that space, all doing things that they, they, they choose to do. Um, but these, these are all pioneers, you know, uh, a second life and, 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 and creatures and all these other virtual world technologies in ways of presenting these environments that human beings can, can go in and, well, for want of a better phrase, live a second life. Uh, in, in, in the case of, of, of Fetch, of course, we're not restricted in the sense that we're not building a world specifically for human beings. We're building a world that supports the machine to machine economy as well. And that actually a great number of the entities that are living in that world and working in that world and getting stuff done are actually digital entities that are responsible for themselves going out there trying to work out how to get what they need and deliver what they've got. Let's let's segue into what 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 fetch fetch is. Um, so I get the sense that um, you're building another virtual world, and. Um, you want to use blockchains in some way and sort of the in inhabitants of this virtual world are who exactly do is, are the inhabitants of this fetch system what are sort of the end network points well um we see uh, fetch as a decentralized digital world in which useful economic activity can take place now that activity is performed by uh, digital entities that we call autonomous economic agents now, these, these autonomous economic agents can act on, on your behalf. Um, they can act on, on their own behalf. They can represent data or services or any other uh, number of things. Uh, and we provide them effectively eyes, ears, and, and, and touch into a digital world that is tailored specifically for them. So these agents connect to the Fetch world through something that we call the Open Economic Framework, which provides them with their their visuals on the world and allows that um, that world to be tailored specifically to them. I, I liken it a lot to the the ultimate the ultimate dating agency for value providers. We ensure that when you connect, what you see is precisely what you need to see or what perhaps you'd like to see, depending on what it is that you're doing. Underpinning all of that and making sure that we can run this in a decentralized global way and achieve the scalability that we want um, is our uh, smart ledger. And the smart ledger is doing a number of things. It's ensuring that we have integrity on the on the global state. Uh, it's uh, in, and that includes, of course, all of the the transactions, the interactions that are taking place between those agents. But also, it's providing the ability for the network to learn how and under what conditions uh, agents interact with each other, so that it is better placed to ensure 
that the ones that are most likely to want to interact with each other are, are placed together. And we also have a whole layer that is provided by that, which is the, the, the trust layer, which lets you look at any transaction as it goes by and establish how likely it is to make it to the global state, which uh, the global state, sorry. Which means that when you're looking at agents that are involved in potentially hundreds or thousands of transactions very quickly in order to construct a solution for someone, you can look at all of these transactions going by and you can make a call uh, very, very quickly in, in a matter of almost no time at all as to whether or not those transactions are going to make it through. It's a big vision, right? And like we, we need to, uh, and at some levels, like I, I've been trying to understand this vision. Like we, I had a call with Toby and Humayun prior. I read the white paper. I've been like thinking about this vision for, for quite a while. And it's a vision in which like there are like lots of components and like uh, you have to think about all of them and then how they connect in order to get to a level of detail that one is comfortable with. So maybe we could start with, um, so you have this idea of these autonomic, autonomous economic agents, right? So, so these agents are, um, could basically be machines, right? They, they could be like devices, mm. right? You could think of, uh, I don't know, a camera as an autonomous economic agent. Uh, you could think of a sensor, camera is a sensor, you could think of a sensor, you could say, think of a delivery robot, you could think of a car, you could think of a human. And these are all off-chain, they have some kind of processing logic of their own, and they can sense the external world. And you're building the virtual world for these entities, right? So what, what kind yes. of objects do you think are going to populate your virtual world? Is it meant to be like Internet of Things devices? There's a number of things going on there, I guess. I mean, one of it is that uh, a lot of the problems that we solve in our day-to-day -day lives are uh, involving an increasingly large number of moving parts, and it's becoming very difficult for us to, to, to manage them. Um, uh, transport is, is, is one of, of the many areas where the number of bits and pieces that you have to, to, to juggle, I mean, it does feel like pushing hot water uphill sometimes, trying to organize all of these moving parts in a way that makes sense to, to the individual. And actually a lot of these problems uh, that, are, that are highly complex and involving um, so many things are actually best not solved from the top down because there's only so many things an individual central controller can, can hold. Um, in, in, in their mind in order to be able to manage all of this. And one of the things that, that, that we thought was, was, was something great about Fetch was that actually these problems could solve themselves from the bottom up. And again, this comes back to my creature's background and the idea that a large population of things can work together to, uh, out of which a, a complex solution can, can, can emerge. And Fetch, as, as you say, Fetch is, is, is not, um, it fetches enabling the agents rather than, than um, actually providing them all by giving them a world that tailors itself to them to ensure that, that they're able to, to do what it is that they want to do with the minimum of friction involved. It really is about clearing all, all the junk away from between party A and party B so that they can get on and do, do what they need to do. And actually agents, um, autonomous economic agents, whilst they, they might uh, represent their uh, data or services or sensors or, or, or people, quite often they actually operate as populations as well. I mean, if you think about it, as you walk around uh, with, with your phone in your pocket, there's an extraordinary amount of sensor information there. And why shouldn't that sensor information actually be represented by uh, an AEA? Uh, and actually out there on the fetch network attempting to generate value from the data that, that it has quietly in your pocket without you being aware of it whilst you're, you're strolling along and going about your, your daily lives. So actually in some cases we're looking at populations of agents that ex exist together. Um, flight hardware or a car is, is another example where if you took a drone You've got the actual bit that flies around, which is an agent, but also the sensors on there might be another agent, and the camera that's on there might be yet another agent. And it may well be that the camera agent uh, can convince the, the drone to take a small diversion in order for it to take roof survey pictures of somebody's house en route. So together, they're, they're working together and communicating with each other independently of, of human intervention to allow better utilization of those things. Because that's one of the things that's most extraordinary about our lives right now. It's not necessarily the data that we do use. It's the data that we don't use, either because we don't know it's there um, or that the cost to, to deliver it exceeds its actual value. And if, when you can come up with 
an endless population of digital representatives to represent that data, then the cost to actually put something like that into the Fetch network and for it to actually generate value goes right down. And under those circumstances, it benefits everybody because suddenly all that wasted information comes into play, whereas previously it would have just gone. Some people in the audience may remember this talk. There was a talk by Mike Hearn from maybe in 2011. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but he was back then the first person to talk about, you know, machine to machine payment on a blockchain and these micropayments. So that was back in the context of Bitcoin and you know how Bitcoin could be great with like payment channels and you could have like, you know, a car driving on the road, paying another car to pass them and, you know, that kind of vision. Now, Bitcoin doesn't seem like it's the right blockchain for that. Uh, although, you know, who knows, maybe with Lightning Network and other things on top, at some point it can get to that. But at least conceptually, I, I understand that vision, right? Because you say, okay, you have all these individual entities, they need to have some way of transacting. I mean, they can, of course, have some sort of wallet in their device and then they can send transaction and then we have this economic fabric where then all of this ac activity and, in a way, uh, applications can emerge and utility can emerge. But, you know, from a sort of blockchain perspective, it's just a user, right? Is it a person? Is it a car? Uh, you don't care, right? It, it's not part of the core protocol. But it feels to me what, what you guys are talking about here is something quite different where this, the in a way, this agent isn't just a user, but it's somehow it's intelligent decision making is also part of this protocol. Do I understand this correctly? Um, yes, yes, you do. The, it, this decision making process is actually really important that to a certain extent, we're putting we're putting geography on on the network. Um, a lot of the, the work that goes on between people are related or entities are related to what's near you, what's around you, and what's in a particular direction. Uh, and being able to structure a network to put um, that dimension uh, onto it is, is something that, that is key to, to providing this, this digital world, this highly tailored digital world to the users of, of, of Fetch. Uh, I'll, I'll probably just add a little bit to that in terms of um, if you compared it, um, you know, the transactional system, let's say the blockchains and everything, and, and, and as you mentioned correctly, Brian, um, we're talking more than that. What you have to um, work backwards from this is, although we have a transactional system, we also need to set a framework for the economy. Uh, there has to be rules, the economic rules, which uh, these agents work under and um, obviously learn from. All these rules are dynamic and they could be changing and they could be evolving as well, just like humans did. Um, but there is a framework which sits, uh, which governs the the interactions, the economic value exchanges. It's not just a transactional system we're building. We're building the second layer up as well. Okay, great. So maybe we can narrow in on that because when we when we speak about the economic context, of course, you know that's right. That's a core part of of, of any blockchain, right? In Bitcoin, you could say, okay, block size is an economic parameter. The block reward, uh, another kind of economic framework is, you know, who gets to decide the transaction fees. And, and of course, that is really the miners by choosing what transactions should they put in a block, you know, the block time, you know, there's all of those things that in, in the end and give rise to a particular uh, economic dynamics, you know, and, and those looked one way when blocks were not full. And then once they were full, they, they started looking another way. So can you speak a little bit about what are those core, you know, economic parameters in fetch.ai and how do you think they will drive the you know sort of the behavior of agents on this system sure so if you if you take uh, the economic framework that's also split in two sections um, one section is more the ledger section uh, which is what you're talking about in terms of the block sizes the rewards for nodes miners um, th that's more a transactional layer but if you then move above that that's uh, that that is only for the transactional um, settlements that's the settlement layer you move above that then you have um, I mean uh, just to give you an example um, you know you have marketplaces now that's a separate economic um, layer because 
in the marketplaces, you have marketplace dynamics, you have price discovery, you have product discovery, you have negotiations. At the moment, um, whatever you, all the projects you look in the blockchain, they mainly worry about the economics of the ledger. We are more um, focused, you know, I, I guess it's a balance, but uh, we're more focusing on, on the layer which is above that. Which, which actually defines the marketplaces itself, which defines, which gives you an opportunity to do price discovery. But don't forget, this is all happening in a very high speed autonomous system. So it needs to be able to adapt. It needs to have its own principles. It also needs to learn from those principles and evolve into a better system. So, so these are the two, it's, there is a split. Even in the economic framework, there is a split. And when I talk about the open economic framework, we are talking about the marketplaces. We're talking about how the economic exchange between the agents happen. We're not talking about the economics of how they settle those economic values. Uh, settlement of those economic values is what the blockchain and the technology, like uh, technologies like that do. We are also talking about something above that. Okay, great. So maybe I should have used Ethereum before as an example, because I think that would have been maybe maybe more analogous, right? So Ethereum, of course, again, we have like block size, gas fees, and, and similar dynamics there, uh, you know, somewhat different parameters. And then if you talk about a marketplace, then I think what that would be in the sort of in Ethereum analogy would be, okay, well, anybody can write some sort of smart contract on it. You know, you could have an auction contract or other contracts that then allow emergent behavior or, or different types of economic interactions. But, you know, you just have a basically an, a, a, a fundamental platform. People can build applications on top. To the extent that there's learning, it's just, well, w person one can write a particular smart contract and maybe people don't use that and they're going to go to another one that's better. And then over time, there was going to be evolution and innovation and all of that. But here you guys are saying that you are directly designing also those applications that in the case of, of an Ethereum would be, you know, user deployed smart contracts. Am I getting this right? Yes. Um, so let me take you through the whole, um, so why, why we're different to Ethereum and yet uh, comparable to Ethereum. Um, you, you you spotted it absolutely correctly. So you're looking at the smart contracts, which is the which is the framework for uh, value exchange on top of the, the settlement layer. So if you look at um, the smart uh, the smart contracts, well, they're not really that smart because you have to put the smartness into it. So you have to come from the outside to put the sm smartness to it. Where we are different is that that we are adding. Um, intelligence into two into both the layers we, where, whereas we're not stopping you bringing um, machine learning and AI from the agent side which is you can actually build as much uh, intelligence as you like into the agent but what inherently you, the agent needs is some intelligence on okay what kind of transactions do I want to do now that information come, can't come from outside when your ledger is doing and recording the transactions so the ledger feeds into as a as a as a toolkit. It provides to the um, economic parties on who are transacting on the OEF. It provides them uh, kind of a prediction model, which says, "Okay, well, th this is the kind of people you want to be transacting with. These are the people uh, who could be interested in your product." Then comes the price discovery as well. So. Uh, the ledger provides the trust element, which is, okay, what is the likelihood of this transaction to, to go ahead? Um, because if, if you were thinking about millions of agents and uh, an agent comes into the market, how do you do search and discovery? How do you do price discovery? Um, so inherently, the ledger and the economic framework has to provide the search and discovery facility. Uh, because you can't bring that from outside. You can make a decision on what you are looking to choose, but you still need a search. No, I, I don't think I agree with that, right? Because let's say on Ethereum, somebody can build a decentralized exchange, there are X, and then people build a, a relayer on top, and then they aggregate all those different you know, offers and trades. 
And then, of course, I can build sort of an agent, right? That is going to go, and I have my smartness and logic, and again, I'm going to, you know, be on the uh, run a node, get all the transactions. I'm going to maybe ping different services, and then I'm going to make some decision making, right? And bring that intelligent into that. So I don't understand what it means for intelligence to be part of the ledger. You're absolutely right. You can make that decision, but we have to some framework has to provide you the tools to make that decision. You need that information to make that decision. Yes, and, and actually one of the cool things that by putting it fundamentally, it's about the difference between stuff being around the ledger and actually on it and inside the network as opposed to around the periphery of it. And one of the very cool things that I've, I've made and I need to really mention about the prediction model is one of the things that we can do with all of that um, is we know as a result of, of any given um, uh, prediction, we know how much uh, on the network, how much value was exchanged as a result of it. This is an evolutionary thing because what we can actually do is we can, we can, we can reinforce those connections that are working and we can negatively reinforce the ones that, that are not. So that means that those drop off and new ones can form speculatively. So all sorts of interesting new ideas as to, as to insights that could be delivered to the network are created uh, all the time and on, on, a, on a constant basis. And all of that really is about ensuring that the users on the outside of the network get uh, a, a bang up to date dynamic impression of what it is that works for them, what it is that does not work for them. This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of leading cryptocurrencies including Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Gnosis, Monero, Golem, Augur, and so many more. When you go to shapeshift.io, you simply select your currency pair, give them your receiving address, send the coins, and boom. Shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange. You don't need to create an account. You don't need to give them your personal information and they don't hold your coins. So you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor. Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is. So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. So you mentioned that this system, it can assess the probability of a transaction going into the final state. Now, uh, you know, we, we've done, of course, countless episodes about different blockchains and consensus protocol. I haven't actually heard of uh, any consensus mechanism that does something like that. So have you guys invented like an entirely new consensus algorithm or how does that work? Yes, we, well, we've, we've, we've had to, we started from the, from the perspective of, well, goodness, you know, if we had 10 million or a hundred million agents and they were all working together to produce um, solutions to, to, to problems, then we, we realized very quickly that we were going to end up with a, a whole new level of requirement for, for performance and scalability. And, but also, we couldn't afford to lose uh, certain information about individual transactions because a lot of the learning that um, our uh, machine learning uh, uh, scientists were, were proposing on, on all of these systems relied on having individual transaction information um, going through the network and not compressing that up or losing it in, in, in any way. And that, that required us to, to take a, a, a different approach to how, how we did this, because you do need, um, in, in, uh, particularly when it comes to organizing these transactions, it's very beneficial to have a, a blockchain type structure where you get the, the well-defined ordering of, 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 all of all of the events. Um, but we needed a different structure to perform um, the uh, the consensus mechanism. We've we've chosen a structure that's a little bit um, similar to a directed acyclic graph because we don't need the direct ordering on the the proof of work tasks, uh, and we can scale that to record any number of, of of results that we want. And we sort of look at it as the 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 the, the blockchain type structure. Um, which we've got uh, scaling through multiple transaction lanes so that transactions that don't affect each other can be executed in, in, in parallel. Uh, that forms effectively the knowledge and the, the proof of work system and the storage of results there performs uh, or generates the understanding of, of that knowledge. 
And these two things together um, give us the ability to create the predictions that we need, but also to create the uh, trust predictions um, so that you can look at any given transaction, any given node, and see how likely um, uh, anything involving them is uh, to be be in your in your benefit and working the way you expect it to, but also to get the performance that that, that we require um, from from a transaction um, uh, capability because uh, we need that to be able to scale and scale and scale as the number of agents in the system increases. So that did require a different approach. Um, the the whole idea that we also wanted to be able to use the computing power that was on that network to be able to do useful work, um, be that actually part of the consensus mechanism of the network itself, the construction of intelligence information about the network itself, um, but also potentially general purpose computation um, that, uh, that users of the network might, might require. And we've looked at a number of things that are in intensely parallelizable, if parallelizable is an actual word. Um, particularly in, in, in biotechnology and, and research into uh, diseases and, and, and genetic conditions, you end up with things that can be divided up into lots of little chunks and potentially can be packaged up and executed um, by, by the whole network for the benefit of, of, of the people who want that. And in cases like that, sometimes the information that is there also prov provides an interesting new understanding and insights that can be explored by the network um, to better connect people uh, in, in, in the future. So I, I just wanted to jump in on that side, point you said, uh, uh, you know, useful proof of work. I saw that in the white paper as well. And, and you know, you mentioned the, the idea of some sort of uh, biological computation stuff. So, I mean, of course, the idea of useful proof of work has been uh, around since... PrimeCoin was the first useful proof of work. Yeah, PrimeCoin 2011. 2011, I think. Yeah, exactly. So I would say that approach so far has basically failed. Because of course the the great the great benefit of something like Bitcoin is that you know you can very easily verify the work, but it's hard to do it. Yes, Whereas with absolutely. most other things, um, you don't have that differential, right? So it maybe it, it takes as much or a lot of time to verify it as as to produce the work, and then that that defeats the entire purpose. So how how are you guys able to do a useful proof of work? Yeah, and of course that is. As 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 you as you quite quickly point out, the idea that it takes a long time to do, but it's trivially easy to verify, is one of the key um, uh, points that that allows such things uh, such things to work. Uh, and we we we've we've cracked it, um, and we've come up with a mechanism whereby uh, the computational um, packages that are put through the system, um, we can create a, a verification purpose, uh, a verification method through that. Um, but also uh, that none of the work that is done by the people who weren't involved in eventually choosing the block is actually wasted. And that's one of the things that we thought was very important about useful proof of work, that everybody who does some processing, no matter how uh, capable their, their machine was, is actually generating um, uh, uh, results uh, for, for the network and is actually receiving um, some form of reward for that. Uh, and uh, we've got a... Um, a, a mechanism by by which the, the the people completing that that proof of work effectively get to to vote on who it is who makes the decision as to which block uh, next goes into the in, into the uh, global state. So we're very proud of the results. Um, we've created our own uh, virtual machine um, specifically for this purpose uh, that uh, is. Um, biased towards solving machine learning tasks, but is also capable of, of general purpose computing, and a mechanism for packaging up those computational tasks uh, so that it is um, possible to verify that the work that uh, was meant to be taking place has in fact been, been taken place. So uh, let, let's sort of su summarize. So the way I understand it is... Uh... Ultimately, the customer of your system is is an agent. So imagine like the agent is me. I'm a delivery robot of some kind, right? And I have my own internal logic. Like uh, I can I can make autonomous economic decisions, like parties to transact with, tasks to take, etc. Basically, an agent like like me can use the Fed system to a uh, get work, like okay, deliver X Y Z here, and you'll get this much money so i will i will get like work proposals but i might also get work proposals that i might not be expecting 
right like so if i'm a delivery robot normally i am expecting mm. delivery work but suddenly it might be the case that um i get a request so i have a camera and when i'm doing my work of delivery i observe that there is so there are some parking spots that are empty and then i have a, i get a request for that data and i supply that data that this particular parking spot is empty that is valuable to a different agent that might want to park there in 5 minutes and so the le- the ledger and, and the fetch system recommends me to give this data and do a transaction on like parking lot data and so the way I, i imagine the fetch system is it is recommending me these economic transactions these these pairings with other agents that i could do but in order to build this system what you are doing on the technical end is a you are building a, a a blockchain a ledger b you are building the marketplaces and the logic by which these agents can match and they can transact c you are building like a useful proof of work for the base ledger itself and d you are building a new kind of scalability technology for the base ledger itself don't you think that's just too much like for example if you had like useful proof of work would wouldn't why why don't you use your useful proof of work and just build a standard cryptocurrency that will itself be such a big invention it's it's often been said that if 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 we achieve even a, a small proportion of some of these things but actually we set out to build this this digital world we set out to build this extraordinarily large decentralized world where huge populations of things could do useful stuff and yes it's a convergence of of a great number of of very very exciting um technologies and actually you touched on something with the with the 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 road they're saying well, you, you get you get some some job to do that that you hadn't thought of and we love that idea the idea that some of the opportunities that are presented are non obvious and and this is one of the things that that um, human beings are so bad at which is predicting the future we tend to extrapolate what the position we're in now and imagine that well the future everything will just be faster bigger and better but essentially the same stuff and we're trying to build fetch or in fact we are building fetch uh, to be an environment where it can adapt to all of those things it can look at novel new combinations of markets and it can adapt to present opportunities uh, that were were never understood before we're building this this prediction model but a mechanism for delivering those predictions and delivering them effectively uh to to the users of the network who who have specifically said they want them but also the ones who might want them and it's that might factor that's really interesting because there's all sorts of 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 intersections of different marketplaces that that we haven't even considered at this point and these are the kind of things that fetch will will learn and figure out and start delivering to users just as a matter of people performing work on that network i'll i'll just add a little bit to it um i think you asked a very pertinent question why are we trying to do too much it's the reason is not we are trying to do too much the reason is what is our objective and our objective is to bring this um this decentralization to the real world now building a currency a cryptocurrency is great because it kind of kickstarts that process but it doesn't deliver effectively what what the end result is because we our end result is we want to connect economic agents which generate economic value not just generate unlock which is plenty of economic value which is unlock lockable uh, there is no framework which allows you to do that now our objective is not to build a currency our objective is not to just build a ledger our objective is to bring these economic values to life so that's our starting point so anything we do in the middle which either it's a, a new type of a ledger is a step towards the objective uh, it's not the objective so that's our approach at the moment sure it's it's just i guess to us it seems like those like many of those steps are like gigantic even even like you said you want to use a cyclic i mean i think that's a nice idea we've we've done an episode before with uh, with the specter guys in in uh, in israel that wrote a, a very good white paper on that but it's also entirely unproven and, and so far there's no i mean there's a sort of quasi cryptocurrency 
IOTA, right? But they have like a central coordinator. So it is not actually, it, it's not real uh, functioning cryptocurrency that does that, right? So that is, I think, interesting direction. But even on its own, like getting that to work, like truly work and decentralized will be like, a, I think, a massive thing. So it feels like, okay, there's so many of these steps along the way that, that seems to be a big challenge that you guys have ahead, at least. We've been thinking about this for a very, very long time, um, trying to, to, to figure out how to, to get all of these component parts together in a way that, that allows us to deliver the, the thing that, that, that we were imagining. Um, and it's, it's just that wonderful position where we, we are able to solve these problems by, by drawing from all of these bits and pieces and then combining them with a bunch of innovations of, of our own to make something very, very different um, that, that's there to do something very, very different. And also, this, this framework is a framework where we can uh, plug and play as well. So we're building it in a modular fashion. So if, if um, new various ways of cryptography comes about, which are better than the rest, you should be able to plug that in. Now, at this point in time, we believe our ledger delivers all the tasks we want it to deliver. It's not which ledger is the best, which ledger is the fastest. It's can it deliver the tasks which we need it to deliver? And unless it does that, uh, that ledger is not useful for us. So we have to build our own technology. Abstractly, like like overall, we have, we have understood sort of the, the vision, at least like that. The vision itself is clear to me. It's like there's like lots of economic agents and you're building like this ledger plus uh, marketplaces and recommendation systems that allow completely new pairings of economic activities to emerge between these agents, right? Like the, your, your ledger plus economic system is going to recommend things to the agents, like do this and you'll, be, you'll get paid that much. And then there'll be another recommendation. And then these agents can choose to act on them and perform some task and get paid and when a lot of like when millions of agents start to work on a system like that uh and they do their small bits of actions the whole system as a sum of, is greater than its sum of its parts it's it appears more intelligent than the intelligent of the in, intelligence of the individual pieces so you're trying to build something like that yes i think like in general from from like you come from a virtual worlds machine learning background we we come from a very blockchain background where probably like we and our listeners got into this space because we found decentralized money interesting right and we are we are we are like we are like really the money nerds like we want new forms of money that's that's what what got us into this so i think the the main skepticism you're going to get from the blockchain community is that the sum of all inventions that you're proposing, it seems like a very ambitious target. And and somehow, like even reading your white paper, like the the personal feedback I had was like a like useful proof of work. So that useful proof of work is a white paper in itself. Scalable ledger, scalable ledger is a white paper in itself. The marketplace, that's a white paper in itself. And, and it's funny you should say that. Um, we we recognize that, and we are actually. Uh, creating white papers on all of those those subjects individually and a bunch more as well um, because they 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 deserve the individual in, uh, attention and there's simply not enough space to talk about them in in, in the detail that, that that people want to see as well um, in in the in the technical white paper as it is so they they, they we are indeed um, working on on white papers describing all of those things in, in more detail but also I I don't want to be apologetic about it being ambitious. I think we are going to be ambitious. It is ambitious, and we expect to deliver the ambition. What I'd like to just point out is, although we are ambitious, we're not insane. So <laughs> all of this is done in a methodical way. So, for example, the innovation in the ledger will in itself be deployable um, and, and that's our first stage of deployment. Uh, on top of that, when we have the uh, open economic framework, that will um, be deployable as a stage. So we're not trying to deploy the whole thing in one go. And, and for people who like money, what 
this would do for you is that it will give you a place to spend it as well because well with everything that is going on you need this currency to deliver some real value as well apart from we're not just coming in to do uh, crypto trading but we're saying there is actually a utility for this uh, currency and not just this currency any currency but, but you need to have that framework where cryptocurrency actually becomes usable this is a structure where you cannot deploy fiat currency and the reason is there's millions of transactions very low value happening at a very high frequency uh, building in an economic framework which is not governed by a centralized organization how do you deploy such a system what we want this project to do is to bring the cryptocurrency to the real world effectively so you just touched on uh, exactly what we wanted to come to now, which is, okay, so what is the sequence and the timelines that we have here? So can you talk about, okay, so, so you mentioned a whole bunch of new white papers coming, and I think that would be very interesting to see more detailed explanation of this. So, you know, when are those released? When is there going to be some kind of alpha, something to use? And then and then these different parts of the systems, uh, yeah, what, what time frames do you think there will be available? Well, we have a, a bunch of the key um, innovations up and running on a private test network in our office right now. And that includes uh, the scalable ledger. We have the virtual machine related to uh, uh, that's going to be used for the useful proof of work that we're using to test in a variety of different things and, and get all of those systems up and working as, as, as we imagine. We have a basic uh, open economic framework that provides an environment to agents and agents that are able to transact and explore and interact on that. From a white paper perspective, we're looking at approximately, give or take a week or two, about a white paper a month um, from, from now on in until the early summer where we're going to be scaling that up a bit because we've got a bunch of things that we want to talk about relating to the actual economics of the space, but also security issues and uh, how to uh, develop um, proper documentation on developing agents and, and, and all of the opportunities that, that exist there. And we're planning on having a public uh, test network that will be available in the summer. And that'll be when absolutely anybody will be able to uh, grab that code and they'll be able to build agents and, and see things actually work on the network. The quality of the digital environment that's presented and the kind of, of predictions of machine learning stuff that will be available will increase gradually in the months after that, leading up to towards the back end of the year. And we're looking at a main network release in the first half of 2019. So that's our current um, development and, and unrolling plan. So uh, what functionality do you expect from this test network? I think it will be there in like June or July, right? Yeah, give or take. Uh, and it, what's important is for it to effectively to be a, a, a complete vertical slice where the, the basic operations that you would expect on such a network are up and running. And that includes all of the, the key innovations uh, working as, as one would expect, but some of the detail not there, uh, particularly relating to some of the, um, the prediction stuff, because the data won't exist on the network, and we'll be looking to um, work with a, a number of partners to, to bootstrap that initial data to get um, the, the, the learning models working. And that's an opportunity for people then to be able to, to get hold of the, the, the software and for them to be able to build, um, build agents and experiment with what might be possible and actually see those agents working on the network. That we're particularly excited about. Of course, of course we can imagine all sorts of things that people can do with the network. But I, I, would, I would guess that that's absolutely nothing in comparison to, to what other people will imagine. Yeah, so, so, so that was my sort of next question which is um when you look at a vision like that you can see that yes if the technology were to exist the application space might be huge because this is about agents they can reside on all devices they can represent humans etc and this is about delivering a set of interesting actions for agents that they can do and generate economic value and the generation of combinations that the agents themselves might not come across so abstractly, this kind of system is applicable to a lot of things, right? But uh, what do you think is uh, is the practical application in the in the short term? So if you have a mainnet release next year, what do you think are the kinds of practical things you can use 
to build with you can build with this system even when there's not lots of data and lots of learning in the ledger itself yeah i mean you're absolutely right bootstrapping uh, a um, a system like this is 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 something that that we have to pay an enormous amount of attention to um I and mean, i liken the thing to uh, virtual worlds you know nobody wants to be the first person to walk into a a shared massively multiplayer online game and likewise you don't want to be told that well what can you do with this well you can do anything because actually if you stand someone in the middle of a world and say you can do anything they tend to stand there not really knowing quite where to start and we're acutely aware that there are a number of of, of marketplaces and, and and use cases where fetch is particularly applicable i mean i'll touch on 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 transport as an example because i've already mentioned it i'm sure hermione has got a, a a couple that um he'd like to talk about as well Transport is one of those things, as I mentioned earlier, it's got a huge number of moving parts. They don't really play very well together. It's operated by a number of centralized um, entities trying to solve complex problems from the top down. And utilization is nowhere near as good as it potentially could be. Uh, and coming up with an environment where actually those complex problems and all those moving parts could work together to solve themselves from the bottom up is is an amazing thing and it could really transform the way in which transport works for the benefit of everyone as well, not just the users of transport, but also the suppliers of all of those moving parts because they can get better utilization, but also better abilities to manage these things and smooth some of the peaks and, and, and troughs. And bootstrapping something like that, there's an enormous number of corporate partners that uh, we're um, talking to and, and going to be working with in the coming months to in, ensure that the kind of data that's in the network is the kind of data that we'd need for usable predictions to be able to be delivered in that subject area. Um, but also access to pre-existing um, data uh, sources and sensors that are out there. And we've got a concept of an agent class called um, an API AEA which is effectively an agent that bridges the old world um, uh, systems and, and computers uh, to the new world and allows them to exist inside the fetch space uh, as an agent. And those are all the kind of things that, that we can do to ensure that the kind of data uh, and the richness that you need to be able to solve these problems in a way that's genuinely useful to people uh, is, is possible um, in the transport area right from, from, from the very beginning. I will add to that. Um... So, so my background has been in supply chain um, and predictive maintenance um, because it connects us all to the commodities sector. So what is quite interesting is that um, we, we are, whereas we are building this dream, we are also very conscious of the commercial returns on such a system because we want to deliver commercial returns um, as soon as possible. So as Toby mentioned, there is a lot of traction in the transport sector, but that leads into something bigger than that, which is a supply chain sector. Now, if you combine logistics, shipping, and predictive maintenance together, I mean, just to give you an example, one of the, uh, one of the biggest returns which, the, which is expected in the short term from predictive analytics is uh, based on predictive maintenance, because we are, we're starting to get towards condition-based um, maintenance anyway. Uh, so, so it would be a very easy win or a very, you know, quick um, area to get the returns from. Uh, so we, we're targeting some low hanging fruits, uh, but then we want to build on top of that, but they have to be in the right way where we can build the right prediction models. And there is a lot of information, which is very low value, which is sitting with the academics which is sitting in the uh, academic institutions, which is not being utilized. What this system will enable you to do is to bootstrap with cheap data and then build some very cool predictions on top. Cool, awesome. Well, thanks so much uh, for sharing this and for joining us today. Now, we're going to have links, of course, to you know your website, white paper, but if people want to learn more about it, get involved, get in touch, what's the best way? Should they wait for the testnet release or wh where do you want to send people to? Um, we have a Telegram channel and uh, our, our website where people can, can interact um, with, with Fetch uh, directly. And of course, of course, all the, the well, we're, we're there on Twitter, um, and we're going to be publishing an increasingly large amount of stuff on, on, on our website in more detail. And, and we're 
we're always interested to, to, to hear from people about and how they might be able to um, work with us with Fetch. Well, Hermione and Toby, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for giving us the opportunity. Appreciate it. And of course, thanks so much for guests for once again joining us. So we're putting out new episodes of App Center every week. You can either get the audio podcast on any podcast application, or you can get the videos on youtube.com slash Epicenter Bitcoin. And if you want to support the show, you can do so by leaving us an iTunes review that helps new people uh, find the show. And yeah, thanks so much. We look forward to being back next week.